Welcome to Energy Dialogues from ADAPEC, a series of conversations we're bringing you in the run-up to the ADAPEC conference. Uh, these conversations are with industry leaders and analysts from across the oil and gas industry, with a focus in this part of the series on the level of digital innovation in the oil and gas industry. And I'm delighted to be joined today uh, by Dr. John Pillay, who is the Senior Vice President of Digital Transformation at Worley. Uh, John, welcome to Energy Dialogues. Thank you, Jeffrey. Great to join you, Brett. Now, the uh, energy procurement and construction industry, or as the shorthand we use is EPC industry, is, is absolutely integral to the success of the oil and gas industry. What is your view of the state of adoption of digital innovation uh, in the EPC industry today? Well, I mean, Jeffrey, it's a complex and mixed picture. And so, uh, as, I, uh, as I'll probably say a few times in this discussion, um, it's difficult to kind of uh, homogenize, but I would say that overall, it's, the trend is very good and very healthy. Uh, what we're seeing from our side is across all sectors, all regions, really the level of seriousness about innovation and digital adoption is in, is in, a, is in, a, is in a different place. And that's across a range of um, innovations. And you'd have to say it's been accelerated by the pandemic. And as you know, innovation thrives in a crisis. Um, I'd say that the biggest thing is this though, um, rather than digital and innovation being a little bit on the side, a little bit of um, sort of tinsel or garnish um, as part of a proposal or part of a project, it's moving much more to the heart of the transformation itself, to the heart of um, core processes. And that's a big difference and that's a big change. Um, and I'd also um, add to this that as we look at the kind of ecosystem that sits around customers and EPCs, the startup industry is thriving. And so there's lots of money, there's lots of innovation that's getting driven by the small players. And that's, a, I think, another very healthy sign for our business. And so would you characterize the EPC industry as at pace or behind its customers or ahead of its customers? And, and in fact, in, in what areas might the EPC industry be leading? It's a, it's a good question. And I think I'm going to have to give you a kind of multi-layered answer to that because there are different levels of investment, different, different levels of ambition. And so and actually customers and EPCs have got different uh, levels of maturity. Um, I'd characterize it a little bit this way. Um, in many cases, the tier ones are driving the process. They wanna hear about the ideas that we've got. They wanna, um, they wanna know that innovation and digital is locked into um, whatever we're doing. In the tier twos and threes, I'd actually characterize it the other way. And so EPCs are, uh, in many cases, actually trying to embed digital and innovation into the process and sometimes are a little bit frustrated by, by attempts to uh, really push that agenda along. Um, the overlay that I would also put is that for some customers, uh, in some contexts, what's transformational to one is actually old hat and pretty boring to others. And so there's quite a lot of context that needs to be put into the mix in order to get it right. Um, I would say this, I think EPCs do their best work when they partner with um, customers. And so the things that EPCs have got on their side is they've got perhaps more capacity and more bandwidth than customers have to look at a core process, look at an asset um, um, in some detail, whereas customers are focused on driving out um, efficiencies within their, within their own operations. The other thing that EPCs have got going for them is, of course, they've got lots and lots of customers that they look at and so they can talk to <clears throat> what they're seeing in terms of best in class and in a company like mine we can also add in a bit of a sector overlay and so you can compare what's going on in let's say oil and gas with mining and so on um, but like i say um, customers and epcs really do their best work together when they're in they're engaged in a partnership and so in, in that light, how do you assess the uh, general readiness of the sector to uh, work collaboratively with its customers in, in, in oil and gas? And, and what are the attributes that you see that might block or enable that adoption uh, curve to, to accelerate? 
Well, consistent with what I was saying before, when the pandemic hit, everyone was scrambling. And so that was a real catalyst, I think, in order to get customers and EPCs working. You know, first of all, just for basic business continuity, but then to start think of thinking about what might be, what the art of the possible might be. And you'd have to say, though, that the biggest blockers are some of the, uh, some of the familiar trends around um, change readiness, um, risk appetite. And so what, what I'd speak to there are a lot of the sort of human factors, the kind of behavioral factors. Um, I think that there is increasingly a genuine appetite to do things differently. Um, and as I was saying before, we, we all do our best work when there's a willingness to try things out, um, to, to try, try new things. I think a good kind of like approach is to try and structure the investment. And so try and de-risk things a little bit. So if you think about the different investments and innovations that you've got, also think about them in terms of a portfolio approach. You know, I'm reminded of what Google do around the 70, 20, 10, where you've got some um, tried and tested, but you've also got more speculative investment investments, and you've got a whole range of how you um, fit those across the, the value chain. In, in these days, you know, besides the pandemic, which is its own economic driver uh, to you know, re relieve uh, industry from exposure to, to the virus, what are the general sorts of economic levers that are most pressing today in the industry? Is it, is it driven by cost or is it productivity or carbon emissions? How do you, how do you see the drivers today in the world of digital? Uh, it's going to be a little bit of all of the above. Um, I would say that the pandemic has been just a massive accelerator, but it's not a driver per se. And so um, if you talk to operate to um, operators, then cost and uh, risk and safety are always um, top of the list. And this, I think, is also speaks to where digital is starting to stand on its own two feet. The, the overall cost and productivity dimension, you really have to tick that box. Um, you have to show uh, the uh, bottom line benefits. And as you know, uh, same, as, uh, same as me, there are trillions of dollars that are caught up in wasted um, processes in underutilized assets. And so that's where digital has got a role in actually helping you to look at problems and uh, look at things in a different way. But despite all that, you know, there is a level of inherent conservatism within our industry. There are risks when things go wrong, it's, uh, it's, it's very bad. Mm -hmm. And so, and it also can be difficult to argue the case for digital because a lot of the cost category that you're talking about is avoided cost, which is a difficult one to prove out to your, to your CFO. Um, but nevertheless, I think as digital technologies start to prove themselves, and as you get more cross case um, comparisons, that overall risk level and the appetite to do new things starts to, to increase. Um, if I go back to the risk reduction side of things and the safety side of thing, uh, things, um, data has a massive role here in improving um, safety outcomes. And so that's going to get better and better and better and more and more sophisticated. Um, and probably possibly final thing I would say is um, as um, that trust level between customers and EPC starts to develop, then that opens the door to new commercial models which really does help um, accelerate the digital journey. Now you mentioned that there, is, there are potentially trillions of dollars in, in um, uh, value that are at stake here. As you look across the landscape of the, the world of the engineering uh, procurement business, where do you see the, the, the greatest opportunities? Is it in supply chain or is it in accelerating design work? Uh, how, how would you characterize that, that landscape? Well, in many ways, um, Jeffrey, I'd say that the clue is a bit in the question, which is if you can integrate these major processes, if you can integrate these phases, then digital can play, play the most powerful role. It's, it's probably, there's a, bit of a, there's, there's a bit of waste that happens between each of the, those different handoffs. And so if digital can be in the thinking right there at the start and then follow through the, the overall life cycle, those are going to be the most successful, most progressive, best set up um, projects and uh, operations. And so you've got to get in there early. So the digital within the design stage, within the front end, that's, that's super important. 
And then as you go through those big dollar stages leading up to um, construction, those project management stages, then it can really sing and dance. Yeah, there's, there's a lot that you can do to extract those efficiencies from everything from schedules, from material management, and those should carry through, of course, into the life cycle of the, uh, the plant itself, into the operations. And so my, my main message is not to kind of like disaggregate the value chain so um, strictly, think about how digital can follow the whole process through. But if you look at the life cycle, there are technologies that you can target, and I think that they will increasingly mature. Um, so an area that you're a bit of an expert in uh, is um, blockchain. And so I think that will make a massive difference in, in terms of supply chain. Um, I think that design, uh, as you start to get a bigger and bigger data set, that will dramatically improve um, the quality of, of estimating cross-case comparisons, um, use of AR, AI and uh, augmented and virtual reality to improve the quality and robustness of design. And of course, uh, in project management from three to four and 5D and so on, there's a big role to be played. So all in all, I think it's a complete package. It's important to get the whole thing right and to get the mindset right through the whole life cycle. And are there, of the, that set of digital technologies that you mentioned, uh, are, are there any that stand out as a simply must do? You, you just have to do this uh, to, to, to even be in, in, this, uh, in this new world. Well, I, I, I often shy away from the question around which technology to go for when a customer or internally when people ask me about it. And the reason for that is I think there's a lot depends on context. And so you really want to know what the underlying problem is and then how digital might be able to contribute towards it. But having said that, um, there are a few kind of digital technologies that have really come of age. And so... Um, if you look at robotic process automation, that's, I think, become a bit of a commodity. And if you're looking for safe bets, then you're going to find them in those automation, the basic automation of processes, and you're going to find them in basic use of data and, and data science. And so if you're the CFO and you're looking for a safe return on investment, I would definitely be looking at those kinds of technologies um, as your safe bets to give you a good um, outturn. And like I say, they've increasingly been proven out in multiple cases. Um, the game changers are gonna be those ones that are more sophisticated. So whether it's um, AI or robotics, um, they will increasingly start to um, dominate the landscape, but they've got a bit of growing up to do. And so they're a little, gonna be a little bit more speculative. Would you agree um, with, with the uh, observation that uh, the combination of these technologies actually creates a greater value? It's, it's, it's uh, like one plus one equals three, that kind of formula. Or uh, how would you characterize that? that? Because this is something I've picked up in my travels, which is that uh, this combination has greater power than the individual parts sometimes. I think that's an excellent observation. And I think it's important to start to look at um, how you can combine different technologies and uh, get, get the most out of them. I think there's an element of learning each one. And so you're gonna get better and you're gonna get more um, targeted in how you apply specific technologies just based on your experience. But if you don't combine multiple technologies together, you're gonna to be leaving a lot of benefits a lot of food on the table. And yeah. so you should certainly have an open mind to how technologies can um, coexist and essentially how you can keep pushing the envelope. Yeah, I like, I like your um, aggregating the different technologies and clustering around a problem. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing to, to bring into this, uh, this structure uh, uh, way of thinking is, is data and engineering firms. Uh, and this would be an assertion, but I, wouldn't, I don't think I'm incorrect. Are uh, actually have significant data sets at, at their disposal to help guide the development of new assets and maintain those assets and so on. But these assets, uh, to what extent can these assets be harnessed, do you think, uh, by the engineering world for, for the benefit of oil and gas companies down the road? Absolutely. They, they, they can be harnessed and really they have to be harnessed. I think that one of the differenti differentiating factors that will set apart um, the, um, the good from the not so good EPCs are the ones that can leverage um, data. And I think customers expect it. 
So customers um, engage you because of your experience and also from what what um, data and what, what you can actually bring to the party in terms of previous work that's been done, um, how you can leverage data assets in order to, how you can bring a toolkit so you can really um, leverage data assets even on the job and as you're um, uh, working through the cycle. And that's the way you're going to get to the business outcomes. So data assets um, should quickly turn into those things that we talked about earlier about a better cost return, um, improved um, risk um, uh, management, all those kind of dimensions. And I think that customers increasingly don't want you to trade, well, the experience is important, but backed up by evidence, backed up by data, that's critical. Let's turn to the question of how work actually gets done in the context of the engineering world. Uh, the, the digital world operates on a, on a mindset called agile or agility, where uh, work is done on, a, on a, a basis where it's time boxed, not necessarily boxed by scope. Uh, how, can, how can the engineering world take advantage of this new way of thinking to accelerate its, its work processes internally? So you're thinking about agile and iterative design, iterative methods, yes. I mean, this is, uh, EPC has been a late adopter. So they're a little bit late if you look at cross-industry comparisons. Um, to um, more progressive techniques from the software development world like Agile. But my goodness, it's on a big run at the moment. And so the benefits of Agile are, um, and the, the approaches around Agile, um, they're starting to take hold. And frankly, there's, there's no going back. What I would say, though, is um, Agile is all about mindset. And so having a mindset where you... You want a quick decision that's been made. You want everyone in the room um, uh, to resolve uh, an issue. You want cycle time. You want to be able to show some working product along the way. Um, I mean, absolutely, this is um, this is a significant and uh, change much for, for the better. Um, what I love about it is how you, you partner directly with the, with the, uh, the customer. And so they're actually part of the overall process and everything is a lot more um, visual. Um, I would say though that in our context, there's, a, there's an element, if you're gonna do anything on a big scale, you need to adapt Agile. So there are some processes, some parts of the overall value or delivery chain that are more amenable to Agile than others. And so a coexisting of traditional methods and agile methods is often the sweet spot um, to get to. And I find people that are very dogmatic about their approach to agile, they're kind of the agile evangelist. I find that they can be a little bit unhelpful um, <laughs> because if you're very fixed in your um, approach around agile, then really you're falling into a lot of the old traps that monolithic phase based waterfall approaches, um, we've proven out, um, you can do things a, a better way. So a kind of mix of um, approaches and an empathy towards the, the um, context, I think that's the, that's the place to get to. Something else to keep an eye on is how, as you scale up Agile. And so um, Agile is very good at um, fast turnaround, um, iterative cycles. Um, you're gonna need to, uh, combine some of the techniques of waterfall with agile and get into your scrum of scrums and safe kind of like frameworks in order to get the best out of it and that takes a, a lot of learning on both sides so it's not all about the epc it's not all about the customer that needs to be uh, coming together there on the different methodologies and interpretations does that make sense oh it makes complete sense and, and perhaps to bring it to life are, do you have any war stories or examples you can share of, of how this has come to, uh, to, to play a role uh, in, in the world of, of digital and oil and gas. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, increasingly our customers are asking us to um, propose, propose in ways that lock in Agile into the processes. Oh. And so they, they want to um, engage with us in those ways. And of course, they've got their own versions and flavors of Agiles within their companies. And so we're being asked to respond in those ways. And as I was saying before, that trend um, will just accelerate. So customers and EPC see the same benefits around getting in the room together and working on the same problems. And that, and 
I, I love the, the approach there, particularly in the front end of the process where you really need to get it right. You've really got to think through things in a way that is collaborative. And Agile really has got a major role Certainly where it, it provides that uh, multiple uh, iterations, allows you to zero in more closely on what the customer is really after and, and uh, how best you can, you can deliver to it. Um, what about, uh, let's just turn back quickly to the pandemic because we are in the midst of it. Uh, has anything, uh, aside from the, you, you've mentioned it's been a huge propellant and accelerant to driving uh, digital adoption, has anything surprised you? Uh, in, in, in how the pandemic has, has driven change uh, more rapidly in the industry than, say, the industry is used to? Well, I mean, Jeffrey has surprised us all, hasn't it? And so the, the, what, what the pandemic has done is um, possibly the biggest thing in terms of kicking things along from a digital point of view is it's opened people's minds. And so... I described earlier how in the earliest days of the pandemic, it was all very uncertain and there was an element of just business continuity and um, survival. Um, but what that sort of started to evolve into is, I would say, and we, off, we talk about back at base, is it like a 10 year leapfrog in terms of digitization of processes. Mm. And so, um, when I think about um, how that has uh, how that has changed the kind of like here and now, there are basic things like um, uh, telepresencing, um, not having the luxury of being able to pour over documents or um, get a wet signature. Um, so some of the basics around um, just getting the business processes to function, and then you start it starts to open up things that um, really should have been done in a digitized or different way all along. So whether it's um, remote inspection, remote solutions, um, use of drones, um, those kind of technologies, um, you start to work with the customer on what the art of the possible is. And so um, in, in our company and in many, many other companies, you've got these kind of new normal initiatives. So this kind of realization that there are many things that you wanna stay different. You don't wanna roll back to um, old practices um, because simply the, the alternative has now been proven out. There's, what you thought was risky is actually works um, absolutely fine. Um, so I think the, the big, biggest surprise factor is just how quick that acceleration has been. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a, a staggeringly fast uh, shift. And, and to be honest, the pace of the change, uh, I would argue, is much faster than humans are normally geared to deal with. I mean, we, we, we're, we're, we're children of an agrarian uh, route, you know, where we, we live for the seasons. Now we're, we're shifting literally overnight. How does this pandemic, coupled with digital, change the, the talent model uh, in the engineering world going forward? I think that's a really great question. And um, if I use my 10-year leapfrog analogy, um, it's really brought forward a lot of those questions around what that workforce needs to look like, what, how they, what kind of skills they need to have. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, possibly top of the shop is actually that adaptive personality and mindset. And so um, you can't get, you've got to get used to um, things changing all, all of a sudden on you and um, being able to respond quickly. Um, hard skills though, um, the things that are really on a charge, and this won't surprise you at all, are those areas around data science, um, data analytics. Um, I think that there'll be a massive revival in terms of some of the older style skills around process analysis, being able to open up um, how process um, works, um, simply because you've got your eye out in terms of how you want to um, optimize it. Um, but possibly the, the biggest talent shift of them all is going to be how there's going to be this hybrid of skills that are going to be required. And so the talent model has been a little bit constrained by um, traditional hard science and engineering type um, backgrounds and, and degrees. Um, I think that what, what's happening around us now is opening the door to more creativity, more innovative, innovative ways of thinking human-centered design, those kind of things, they're gonna change the talent model forever, I think. And how we work alongside these technologies that are gonna be part and parcel of uh, our everyday work. 
Um, I'd add in one thing, Jeffrey, um, one other thing, um, which is that the, 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 the kind of way in which we engage staff, that's on the move as well. So for the longest time, we've talked about the gig economy and about how um, people interact with the workplace. Um, as we see all around us, that is just, I think that's, we're living that reality now. And so it's not a hypothetical thing anymore. It's, it's something that we've, we've had to adapt to very quickly. And that will have a long-term effect, I believe, in how we um, have a more distributed sourcing model for how we find talent and uh, how we get them into projects. And, and just to wrap up, do you feel that digital and a, a way of digital change has altered in any way the nature and kinds of risks that, that industry now needs to face? And here I'm thinking about, uh, you know, the an obvious one is cyber uh, activities stepping up. Uh, but are there other critical risks now that, that need to be put squarely on the agenda for uh, leaders in oil and gas and in, in particularly engaging with engineering businesses? Sure. So, I mean, if I put on my black hat a little bit, the cybersecurity is, is significant and it's important to manage and it's, it's always going to be a threat that um, you need to have um, at the front of mind. But also think about bad uses of data. So along the way, we've talked a lot about how you can leverage data, make it into important um, a critical asset. Um, there's lots of bad um, uses of um, data as well. Um, false um, connections. There's, there's also um, quite a lot of base building in order to get your, your data right. Um, I think automation brings with it some new and special risks. So you can do things, you can do the wrong thing in a, in a, a vastly accelerated way. And so that's, uh, that's something to keep an eye on. If I, if I look at the strategic overlay, though, Jeffrey, I, I would, um, I think there is a risk of tokenism. And so having lots of fragmented, um, going shopping for lots of bits and pieces of the, uh, of the digital toolkit and not having them brought together. I worry a bit about how, um, what the MIT guys call the fashionista kind of mentality where you have a little bit of everything. And actually you make your configuration and your work set up more complicated um, than it could or should be. And so I think there's something to keep an eye on there at a strategic and a, and a corporate um, uh, use. Um, and if you go back to the, the previous question about what's going to happen to the, the workforce, um, that's a big thing for us to keep in mind. What's how we bring people along the, uh, the journey, how we arm them for those new skill sets um, for the future, how we're going to work um, differently. That does introduce some new risks. And so there's a big case here for leadership. So just getting the, the leadership right, being focused around your um, various digital efforts. Um, I think you can reap um, the benefits of digital and start to manage down some of those downsides. John, I'd like to thank you very much for coming on to Energy Dialogues today and sharing with us your perspectives on these important questions. Jeffrey, thank you very much for the opportunity. Great to see you. Good to see you too. This brings to an end this, uh, this discussion. Please uh, revisit uh, in short order for another episode of uh, Industry Dialogue uh, coming to you from Adipec in the run-up to the conference the, uh, later this year. Bye for now.